Wonderful. One more minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell it all at the end. There we go. All right, so just for the people who are joining us um, on their um, Zoom link, hello everybody. Um, and just to um, let you know that we have a very small um, group of people gathered here on the Abbott back deck on this balmy evening. And um, we're going to have this panel um, in real life. So you will be virtually sharing the Avid Reader back deck with us, which should be really fun. Um, if you have any problems with any of the technical stuff on the way through tonight, um, put it in your chat function and um, Ashley, who is inside the store, will be able to um, uh, take your message and pass that on to me. And because we are in Avid Reader, as we used to be in the old days, we have the ambient noise. <laughs> so um, welcome to, you know, the Zoom area where cars start, where a siren goes off, where some yoga group decides to do a screaming night that has happened in the past. Um, so anything could happen because we are currently in real life. Who knows? So um, I think that we have most people in, although there are some more people in the waiting room, I think. So um, I think Ashley's letting some more people in as we speak. Um, but as she's doing that, I might kick off proceedings. So I'd like to start this evening by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on in this area in real life in Avid Reader. It's the Yagra and the Turrbal people. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to mention that because of Zoom, we are heading off um, and out around the country onto many, many different Aboriginal lands. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders all around the country on who, whose ever land you may be on tonight. Uh, so really, it's just my job now to make way for the wonderful Ashley Hay, who is going to um, kick off proceedings tonight. Now, Ashley Hay is an amazing writer of novels and nonfiction, and she is also the editor of the Griffith Review. So um, we're all going to put our hands together for the wonderful Ashley Hay. <laughs> Oh, probably do. Probably yeah. do. I didn't. I didn't mention the questions. Can you mention that people can put questions in chat? I can. Oh, I've just been tasked by Chrissy with uh, telling the people in the Zoom room. Turn that down. That they can send their questions through as we go. We're going to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, so you can put them into the chat function, and they will be sent through to Chrissy, and Chrissy will pass them on to the panel at the end of the talk this evening. Um, so, hello everyone, and welcome to our first hybrid launch with Avid Reader after all those months of not being able to have any of us in the room. I think we're going to, yeah, we're all right. Thank you. I've stopped speaking. Um, yes, after all those months of not being able to have any of us in a room together, it's very exciting to have at least some of you here and to know that the rest of you are out there um, in the ether joining us remotely. We're thrilled that you can join us wherever you are. My name's Ashley Hay, as Chrissy said, I'm the editor of Griffith Review and I am delighted to be introducing our most recent collection tonight, Griffith Review 70, Generosities of Spirit. I'm even more delighted to be introducing our conversation tonight. It's going to be facilitated by our managing editor, John Taig, with four of the contributors to this edition, Rihanna Boyle and Kate Veach, two of the winners to this year's novella project and Alana Hunt and Christina Olson, who were two of the recipients of our Arts Queensland Griffith Review Queensland Writing Fellowships. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each of these wonderful people in a moment and a little bit about Griffith Review, but I'd also like to add my own acknowledgement um, of the custodians of the land where we are tonight in West End, the Yagara and the Turrbal people. And as Chrissy said, to acknowledge that because you're joining us from everywhere, 
you're on the lands of lots of different traditional owners. Um, I'd like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging of the world's oldest continuing civilization and acknowledge the privilege of being able to join together and tell our stories tonight on this continent of stories. So Griffith Review publishes a quarterly journal of good writing and ideas alongside a suite of new work online every quarter. And these explore a different theme every edition. So I like to think that, you know, you have a stack of books on your bedside table, which you know you should read to get across the thing that everybody is talking about at the moment. Really, all you need to do is just read one book, and that's ours, because it will bring you lots of different points of view, lots of different voices, lots of different genres, exploring everything from ageing to trust, to Europe, to nature, to resources, all sorts of different directions to heading. Our latest edition, Generosities of Spirit, was sparked in part by a conversation that I had with another writer who ended up in this edition, Linda Neal, who was another one of our Griffith Review Queensland Writing Fellows. Linda and I, some time ago, were talking about the importance of generosity and of gratitude in all kinds of spheres and communications. And that phrase, generosities of spirit, struck me as one that it might be nice to hang on to and explore a little bit more. We scheduled this title for the fourth edition for 2021, uh, 2020, sorry, all our books this year sat under an overarching theme of transformation, which given the year that we've all had, turned out to be a pretty useful idea to be working with. But I have to say that generosities of spirit feels like a particularly appropriate phrase to offer up to our readers, a particularly good sentiment to bring to you as the year closes. So the book holds the winners of our final novella project, and I'd like to acknowledge the support that we received from the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund for this project, which has run across eight years now. Congratulations to all our winners, Claire G. Coleman and Mikhail Prestia, as well as Kate and Rihanna. And my very great gratitude too, to our three external judges this year. Mirandi Rewo, who I am super excited, is in the room with us, having you know just hot off the press won her own new prize. Um, Angela Meyer and Holden Shepherd, who I think is out in the Zoom universe somewhere. I'd also like to say a huge thank you and welcome to Nicola Evans from the Copyright Agency Cultural Fund, who I am delighted to actually be seeing in real life after a lot of conversations over the phone. The book also holds a wonderful combination of other fiction and non-fiction and poetry. We have never received so many submissions of poetry as we did this year. All of them explore ideas of generosity and kindness of altruism and epiphanies in lots of different wonderful ways and different with different wonderful voices. It feels to me like this book is the literary equivalent of the beautiful artwork we've got on the front of the book by Louise Zhang, Samples of Brilliance. So I just want to introduce you to the five people behind me and get out of the way. Uh, first of all, John Tay, who's the managing editor of Griffith Review. When I was in the world where I could write things for Griffith Review, I knew John as one of the finest editors in the business, and it was one of the attractions of taking the job as editor to get to work with him in a more editorial way. John's worked for a host of publications across the years, including the NME, the Times Literary Supplement, and the Independent on Sunday. And the end, end of our production cycles are often marked by a flurry of emails from our writers, thanking John and thanking our senior editor, Carity Culver, who's also in the room, for the wonderful work that they've done with the writer's words. And I would just like to add my thanks to both of them as well. John's going to be in conversation tonight with four contributors. So let me introduce them to you as well. Rihanna Boyle has written about science and conservation for publications, including The Lifted Brow, The Big Issue and Best Australian Science Writing. And her contribution to this edition is Mount Trepidation, which was one of our novellas. Alana Hunt is a Bakenji woman who's completing her creative writing PhD through the Anglia Ruskin University. Alana's published several short stories and two of her manuscripts were highly commended in the Black and White Inaugural Writing Fellowship. Her contribution as an Arts Queensland Griffith Review Queensland Writing Fellow is a new short story, Blue and Black. Christina Olsen is an award-winning writer of fiction, non-fiction and journalism. Her most recent novel, Shell, was published by Scribner in 2018 and shortlisted for several literary awards. Her contribution, also as a Griffith Review Queensland Writing Fellow, is Invisible Histories, which is an extract from a hybrid book of non-fiction using deep history, philosophy and memoir to explore our responses and ties to the natural world. And last but by no means least, Kate Beach, who is the author of two novels, Listen and Trust, 
and is currently at work putting together a family of five linked novellas. Her contribution to Generosities of Spirit is one of the four winning novellas called Inheritance. We were hoping to have two of our poets with you tonight. They have been laid low by COVID proportions, not by COVID itself. So it's my great pleasure now to hand you over to John Taig for a conversation that explores some of the stories in this edition of Life Through. Um, welcome to Abbey Reader, everyone. Um, please report this is indeed Abbey Reader, not Abbey Reader Total Landscaping, where there is an alternative lodge going, where I hear they're going to make America really big. <laughs> anyway, we've got something new here in the room now. It's people from New South Wales, which we haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, moving on, um, we've got four very diverse stories here. Um, <clears throat> and one of the ways I thought of being able to look at them is to think about who narrates them, who speaks is what Roman Barton used to ask about uh, any kind of piece of literary fiction. Um, Chris, I think it's so with you, actually. Um, okay. <laughs> the piece you published here is an excerpt from a larger work, yeah. um, which kind of ranges from the deepest of deep time to the present. Um, it goes through family history, personal history. I wonder if you just tell us a little bit more about the project as a whole. Yeah, as a sure. And, and may I start by also thanking Griffith Review and you, John, and Ashley Hay. My books take at least five years to get done. And in that time, I learned a great deal. It's almost like deep time, deep learning. Um, and uh, so often Griffith Review has published excerpts of those works in progress, which have made an enormous difference to how those works have progressed. Having to actually come up with something to a deadline is usually the time when I have to produce something. And this latest version of Griffith Review with, with Ash at its head, uh, I mean, it's always been the most magnificent magazine, but I think it's absolutely the best in Australia now and the quality of the work. And I haven't even read much of this one, so I'm not talking about mine in this one, but uh, I think it's fabulous. So thank you for the opportunity to you guys and all of you who sail and her out there. Um, okay, so this one started probably six or seven years ago when I was writing Shell and I had to, of course, put one of them aside. Um, I've always been interested in rocks. <laughs> when I, people ask me about this book, I say it's about rocks and they run away, which is kind of good because I don't know what to say otherwise. Um, but I'm really, I've been really fascinated by the Brisbane tuff that makes up the Kangaroo Point Cliffs. I think everyone would know would know them and they, I can tell you, were formed by a volcanic explosion 226 million years ago. Uh, it's fascinated me that they have made Brisbane look, well the rock has made Brisbane look the way it is because the tuff was used in the earliest buildings in Brisbane as well, in the commissariat stores, in a few of the cathedrals, all the curbing you see in the inner suburbs is all Brisbane tools. And it ran under the piece of land I grew up on in New Farm in Brisbane in the 50s and 60s. So it kind of began when I was trying to put together answers to why my siblings and I are still viscerally tied to this block of land in, in New Farm, even though the house is no longer there, but there's, there's flats on the land, it's still the place where we take husbands and lovers and children and say that's where we that's where our hearts are that's where we grew up and we are still there in many in many ways so it began with knowing that the rock ran under that block of land and how what's under our feet might affect who we are in terms of informing our identity and then my son and his wife and, and two little children moved back to Christchurch not long after the two big earthquakes and in my outrage <laughs> they would do that um i started to wonder whether my grandchildren would dream more precariously or always see the earth with cracks in it because they were growing up on this very unstable ground when i would grown up on this solid rock that runs 80 meters under brisbane 80 meters this rock when they were tunneling under Brisbane for the tunnels. They had to get particular diamond drillers in to do the work through the tool because nothing will cut it. So yeah, what, what was happening there? So of course it was always going to involve deep history in terms of geology, but also deep history in terms of Aboriginal people and who had walked across that land, like human, animal, what plants had grown there and, and why. 
but it's been a very long gestation. And in that time, John, I have it, the story has somersaulted into uh, other things. So it started out as a search for meaning in terms of landscape attachment, the idea of sacredness in land, but it's turned into something altogether different. Do you want to know what that is? Please, please tell us. <laughs> Well, it's only really happened in the past 12 months or so, and some of it even in the last few days or so, when I began to realise the extent of uh, the, the difference between our way, as in uh, non-Aboriginal settlers here, and Aboriginal ways of seeing sacredness in landscape, belonging in landscape, ownership of landscape and land, which I, I'd always known at an intellectual level, I suppose. Um, and had spoken to Aboriginal people about this. But it wasn't until recently, and this is what happens and why it takes me five years or six to write a book, things have just sort of just trickled into, into my consciousness, I suppose. And I spoke to an Aboriginal woman who some of you might know, her name is Dawn Daylight. She's been a West End personality for a long time. And went to speak to her because what I found out was that while I was having this very happy childhood on that block of land in New Farm in the 50s and 60s, there was this young woman, not very much older than me, who was having a completely different youth and childhood behind the tough walls of All Hallows Convent. So a kilometre away from where I was growing up. That wall was made when they carved Anne Street in half and lined it with tough. She was taken from her family in Ipswich, from her mother, very strong family. Mother was a horsewoman, sang and told stories and cooked up big pots of stew, they're a very happy family. So no one knows why she and her sisters were taken. They just were. So when she was 12, she found herself locked up in All Hallows Convent and the very bottom layers where there are cages, that are not, well, the, the windows look caged, they're all barred. They would be locked up at night, unlocked in the morning and sent to the kitchens and the laundries. So she spent eight years there and in all that time didn't see her mother who she adored and was incredibly close to, as I was with mine. So as we started to have that conversation, she asked me about my family story. And of course, uh, that always makes me cry. So suddenly we were both weeping and I felt her hand come across the table and grip mine. And I apologize, of course, because her loss was far greater than mine, I felt. Uh, and she just said, no, 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 this is what we have to do for each other. And it kind of, that was the beginning of the change right around in terms of how I how I would see how I'd see my experience on that land. And it's not about the word reconcile. It's not about that. I don't think it's possible. I think there's something else that's possible in these in the ways of looking at these two stories. It's some other way of seeing and relinquishing the way we see things. It's taking a long time to come to it because of my visceral attachment to that land. But now I can see that, yeah, the idea of ownership means nothing, absolutely. And I can finally say that despite, yeah, my family connection. Thanks. Um, you've written both fiction and non-fiction. And now you're just talking about these kind of intense experiences with um, Dawn, and you're talking about telling truth. But I wonder when it comes to writing the two, which is easier, do you think, in order to tell truth? Is it easier to kind of have a, something much more like a, you know, a memoir, a biography, whatever you want to call it, or is it much easier in a, with a fiction strategy? I, I, I think the whole idea of the truth is very vexed in both of them. Um, I think in memoir especially, not that I teach memoir, I teach memoir here at Avid Reader, and people come to classes thinking that's what they're going to write when they write memoir not realizing that it's impossible yeah. to this, the truth is so subjective. Yeah. Whereas in fiction, I think that's why we go to the best fiction is because it has its own truths. And if it hasn't got the, those, uh, those truths, then we put the books down. But it's got to have that heft in terms of, of the feeling and the emotion of it. So I think, I think sometimes fiction can be trickier in, in that way, unless you, unless you, unless you, marshaled all your humility and all your compassion for what you're doing and and allow those you know the, the truths to come through in the fiction whereas in memoir it's something else altogether i think yeah. and we've got to really um i think we've got to pay a lot of attention to that and know that we can't possibly 
write the truth. In, none, none, none of us are writing the truth in memoir. And it's not because we're not trying. It's because there's just too many versions of it. There was no such thing as a shifting, it's, it's, a, it's a shifting idea. I mean, you all, all know that if you sit down with your family recalling, you know, your mother or your father 50 years ago, some will say, oh, that's right, that was hilarious today. She was wearing that red jacket. And some will say, no, it was green. Some will say, no, it was actually red. And some will say, well, she wasn't wearing a jacket at all. And so everyone has their own subjective ways of remembering and and there are reasons for that. You know, we all, we're all, I guess, yeah, saving ourselves in some way. Okay, well, yours is the only, you know, the only piece of non-fiction that I'm here. I just wanted, following that, to bring Alana in. Um, your story, Alana, is narrated from the point of view of a 10-year-old white boy. Um, now, the last piece of yours we published was a multiple narrators, now you've chosen a single narrator. I'm just wondering what the thinking was behind that. Well, this was originally meant to be um, multiple narrators as well, because <laughs> um, I would like to eventually expand it to be a novella. I originally had an idea for it to be um, more of a literary horror, and but to sort of tell the short story, I thought, what is the core of the story I want to tell? And it was looking at domestic violence for Aboriginal women and especially that sort of the invisibility of it and how does that get to to people that, that they don't have to learn about that, they don't have to know that, those situations. So I thought it would be a very interesting thing to write from the point of view of a 10 year old white boy of coming to terms with this person that he grows very, very close to, that this is her reality and that he has to either ex try and help her out of that reality or does he try and block that out himself so i thought it was a really interesting point of view to try and go through and also it's kind of the historical piece isn't it? it's a period piece that's at the end of the 60s i'm again i'm wondering what you know curious as to why i wanted to show that period or was it i mean was it the originally because originally it came from a dream so that's oh, really? why it, wow. it, it was that was the original thought of it um, but when I want to expand it, I want to sort of look at the changes from the 60s to modern and that still that violence towards women, especially with what happened with Miss Do, um, and look at that, that extra layer of fear of where do you reach out for help? How do you reach out for help when the very people that you can be reaching out for help will be the ones that can put that uh, commit more violence towards your body? Um, so I really wanted to do that comparison of the 60s and to now and see, I mean, obviously things have changed, but there is still so much more there. I think that it's, it's easy to say that things have changed without maybe looking at what is still an experience of sort of what you said, that um, your reality of where you're living can be perfectly fine, but meanwhile someone next door is having this completely different reality of what's being done to them and they don't know where to go for help. So that's what I really wanted to explore, that sort of the juxtaposition of both. Okay, I mean, your title is Black and Blue, which obviously is indicating, you know, the colours are playing a part here. And although it's a very personalised story, it does move towards the kind of community in which it's set. It's ultimately, they're all implicated in the kind of violence. Yes, definitely. Um, I think especially as well, it was that you know, bringing the church into it because of things, you know, obviously because of things that have happened and that putting it in the too hard box because you want to have this belief that these people have the best um, wishes for you or would never harm you. And it is a very scary thing, I think, to step out of that space. I know when I first started my studies of Aboriginal deaths in custody, it was a very scary space to step into because you wanted to try and stay in this reality where no, I feel safer, even though you knew that that reality was happening just right there. And in fact, I was part of that reality, um, especially, you know, my family. And I think if you don't have to know it, I think it can be very tempting to step back and go, because this feels safer, this feels better, this feels happier. And it's sort of you know, this young boy of trying to bring that out into the open rather than keeping it hidden and making everyone more accountable to like, let, let's not hide, let's mm -hmm. actually face this, then we actually can make this a better reality if we actually face it. It's interesting because you mean the, the church figures in the story, so the police, but the kind of encounter with the police were actually quite 
sympathetic to start with, or but there's a kind of impending sense of threat around um, the cops, I kind of felt. Yes, um, that was an interesting one, because I, I think was from the, the previous story that I wrote, it was, you know, very much about the violence, you know, um, with in police, and, um, you know, custody. I wanted to explore that side of as well of that hierarchy within the police that you can be sympathetic, but how hard can it be as well sometimes to push that agenda when yeah. people don't, that doesn't want to be reality again of this powerful figure of how do you bring that powerful figure down as just one person within, you know, this, this community that might, that might want to see that. So I sort of wanted to explore that a little bit too, of that it's not simply sort of black and white evil, yeah, yeah. not evil. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to want to do your best, but how do you sometimes and how hard that can be. Sure. On a different, what's it like narrating from the point of view of a 10 year old? I mean, was it hard mm -hmm. to kind of get your head in that space? Or? Uh, it was actually quite fun sort of, I think, revisiting those, you know, those really happy memories of like initially of like, you know, I just sort of put that thing of attend those certain things that were just the greatest adventure. And, but also that shattering thing of when reality does pierce that adventure, which was something that um, myself and my siblings had that, you know, we were very aware of certain violence that was you know happening to us and you know racism that was happening to me at you know four years old and you had to be aware of these realities when all you wanted to do was go on this great adventure yeah right well i'm just going to move on to you kate now i am moving from the narration of a 10 year old although the narrator in your story is a 42 year old woman the, a teenage girl figures very prominently in the story um, but before we go into that, I'm just kind of interested because you were mentioning because you published two novels, but that's quite a while ago, and you've been mentioning that you've been struggling with fiction. So I'm just wondering um, what brought you to this story in particular? Uh, to this story in particular, mm, well, I guess I could say that it's, it, it, it follows in the theme of of my novels, it's really the only subject I'm interested in is modern tortured families. <laughs> I will say that somewhat facetiously when I was on book tour or what have you with the with the novels. People say, "Oh, what 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 are your you know what do you write about?" I'd say modern tortured families because you know, and we all know we all come from what, don't we? You know, um, and and this is just another one. And the the wonderful thing about fiction is that you get to make up somebody else's modern tortured family or several of them because they all are. Um, uh, why I struggled with fiction for 10 years, I don't know. I think my inner perfectionist really came out and it was just very difficult. You know, that, that there's I, I have some thanks to offer for including to Griffith Review for keeping my head above, you know, writing water um, in that period where I just couldn't couldn't finish any fiction. It wasn't that I couldn't start, I couldn't finish. Uh, uh, but uh, but I could write essays, kind of these little memoirish essays, uh, and they were just easy and a joy to write. And uh, I only wrote them for the Griffith Review. I never wrote for anybody else. And uh, I'd get a, I'd see what editions were coming up, what themes, and if the theme sparked an idea for an essay, I would write it. And God bless them, they published every one that I sent. And I don't, I've never told Griffith Review what that meant to me, but I will tell you that when I finished this novella and sent it off, I was so sure it would not get picked. I mean, so completely sure. When I got the email saying that. It had been selected. I read the first line. I had to read the first line several times because I was so sure it was saying that I hadn't been. And I just burst into tears. Very sophisticated, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's it's a huge thing for me to have this published. It, it it was kind of heartbreaking and tortuous to not be able to write fiction 
for so long or not be able to finish fiction. Um, and this novella I had actually had a crack at uh, some years ago in a different form um, and put it away. Uh, and then I read, there was a particular novella that Griffith Review published in one of its earlier novella editions by Nick Earls. And it was just beautiful. I mean, it's such a perfect novella. It was, it's called now Gotham. Mm -hmm. It was called something else, a different yeah. title. Yeah. And it was yeah. first published. Yeah. And then he wrote four others and I put together in this series of beautiful little, five little books called collectively The Wisdom Tree. And they're just magic. And, um, uh, and, and, and he was, he, he did a workshop where, where I, near where I live in, in Byron last, mid last year. And I went and did that workshop and he said something that was so important to me. It was just like this, 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 you know, sh clear water that just drops from the sky and refreshes you and washes all the all bullshit clean. He said, the thing about writing a novella is that no matter where you are in it, even when you're right in the middle, you can still see the beginning and you can still see the end. And I thought that, that's what I need. That's what I need because writing a novel is such a huge undertaking. And I was just getting, you know, calmed, storm tossed, you know, you name it, everything would happen with the novel novels I've been trying to write. And this novel, I loved writing. Absolutely so enjoyed writing it. And so now I've decided to copy Nick Girls completely and write for <laughs> others. But yeah, they are very linked. And in the modern torture family scene, there's threads of family that actually go through all of them. Although you talk about torture families, this is not an optimistic story, though. It's, and it seems to be a story about love as well. Um, Sorry, it is or isn't an optimistic story? It is an optimistic yeah, story, I think. Yeah, yeah so it is. So the families are tortured, but they're not that tortured on the whole. It seems to be about difficult loves, if, it, if it's not about absence of love. Oh, quite so, quite so. And that's the facetious bit of modern tortured families, because, you know, I, I, I am by nature optimistic and and uh, um, and I and I do think that, that it, that we we can find and muddle our way through extraordinarily difficult and complicated situations often that we make more complicated ourselves uh, and that help can come clarity can come from utterly unexpected sources i mean the teenage girl in this novel who um uh who who, who assists really the 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 um um the 42 year old uh, main character to find her way through uh, through through to a new life really and to a resolution of the questions and secrets from her old life she's uh, she she's a little rat bag you know she's she's such a kind of snaky little goth and you know she's she misbehaves and, and yeah she's not she's not an expected source of um, uh, of of clarity or enlightenment and you know that's isn't that life you know isn't that isn't that so that if you're the, the words of wisdom and the real help don't necessarily come from you know a guru or a sage they can come from all sorts of places from someone homeless on the street, you can get something, something extraordinary. Just going to talk about in terms of narration for the story, because the teenage girl has, this is not an un uncanny tale by any means, but she has certain kind of feelings about something, but kind of, in the story, the, the, the central character has come back because the father's basically committed suicide because he was like um, getting too old to kind of function. And they're looking for a suicide now, and I kind of wonder with the with this kind of she's got a feeling about it, and which actually leads to the ultimate resolution. Um, it seems to me that this, this element seems to be almost a different sort of narration. There's almost like an unconsciousness kind of peeping through. I just wondered what you were doing with that device. You know, 
it's interesting. And when um, it was actually brought that that up about, you know, could, I think you wanted me to dial back a bit on the on the uncanny, <laughs> and I was like, no, nah, it's uncanny. She's uncanny. That's how it is. Um, I, I that didn't seem that odd to me. I mean. I think that there is, there are all sorts of layers of consciousness in different people, and that teenage girl has has a, a thinner skin in a way between what usually separates us from our unconscious knowledge of things and our our, our ability to to manifest that consciously. So she's just someone with a thinner skin. It doesn't seem that odd to me, but it did make me think about it and. I remembered something that actually I'd forgotten I read it. It was in a Faye Weldon novel that I read many years ago. It so struck me. This woman in middle age is, I can't even remember the plot, but she's in great danger from some bad people. And she's in the London underground and one of these baddies tries to push her in front of the train. And she feels somebody kind of swoop and grab her and pull her back and it's an old lady it's a little old lady and this little old lady is standing there completely gobsmacked and astonished at what she's just done she's like all she can say is like how did i do that and it, it was a tiny incident and i thought oh that's fantastic people i, I love it when something cracks through the the expected it isn't what the story becomes about, but it's just like a crack. And, uh, and, and I think that really influenced me. I always wanted to write something that had that, that crack uh, in it. But in the case of this novella, the teenage girl, her, 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 her unexpected capacity is, is in her, uh, what she's able to do. Just, she's an acute observer. The connections she's able to make, make between what she observes and her unconscious awareness. Does that make any sense? It does make sense, oh. yes, but I should be moving on now. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rihanna, um, could you pass the mic? Yours is a story set, again, it's another period piece, but this is in the early 90s, and it's a set among, uh, amongst a support group for the people who are. HIV positive, but who are basically in denial that HIV is an illness. Now, this has obviously got incredibly contemporary resonances, but you didn't conceive this as some sort of COVID story or? Um, no, I mean, I just, I guess my, my background is sort of as a science writer, and part of my interest in science is an interest in pseudoscience as well. And I was just reading a bit about sort of various brands of um, kind of HIV denialism um, and I just came across just a, a snippet about um, you know there was a community one of the members started becoming a bit unwell and showing a little bit of doubt about um, perhaps some of what the others in the group were thinking um, which which led to them turning on him in quite a vicious way wow. so um, I just thought that was Kind of an interesting setting for a story um and i guess the, the contemporary resonance is coincidental but um yeah i guess it just goes to show that history doesn't throw up a lot of new things it's the same old things <laughs> but you mentioned you've, you've got a background in science and as far as i'm aware you really haven't written too much fiction no um i did it a little when i was younger i started out doing a creative writing degree um got a bit depressed with my writing career um yeah and have mostly done science writing so this is um yeah it's the first fiction that i've had published for a long time but i mean just not to too fine a point on it it's an extremely sophisticated work of um narration in the sense that the central character the the, the narrating point of view corinne is not is an unpleasant person not to put too fine a point on it <laughs> and now when it comes to reading fiction as a reader, you don't always necessarily want to spend too much time with an unpleasant person, but she still has a certain sympathy and you kind of pitch that very well. So this is what I'm kind of slightly like surprised about. I mean, what would you, I mean, because this is a story about denial, isn't it? Um, yeah, it was, um, I found it quite difficult to get 
the right balance um, of sort of sympathy for the character and then um, it's not so much the sympathy, is it? It's just the fact that you don't hate spending time with her, actually. No, I mean, thing. you sort of get into her headspace enough to put up with it, I suppose. Um, <laughs> did it take a lot? Do you have to kind of redraft a lot? I did or? a lot, yeah. Um, so, I mean, I suppose the story, from my point of view, is really about her friend Jeff, who is the, the character who is um, yeah. starting He's to, like the skate, to go, that, yeah. Yeah, go against the rest of the group. Um, but I didn't want to tell it from his point of view thought it would be more interesting to sort of see some of the machinations behind the scenes um so it had to be from the point of view of this character who um is involved in giving him a bit of a hard time um yeah my first few drafts i think i probably overplayed her bad behavior um yeah i mean i guess stories i've read where the narrator is too harsh on the character it can be quite counterproductive. Um, I've sort of found myself sympathising with this character because I feel like um, the writer is giving them too much of a, of a beating. <laughs> and I mean, I guess, you know, everyone, um, you know, in their own mind, their own behaviour is perfectly justifiable. So if you're sort of going to, um, mm. yeah, write in sort of close third person, you need to kind of go along with what the character is yeah, thinking. But it's kind of those classic, almost unreliable narrates from the sense that the reality that the reader perceives is very different from the reality that the central character or the narrating character perceives. Yeah, I mean, she's sort of not unreliable in that she's sort of giving you a patchy or um, inaccurate depiction. It's just that her perception is wrong, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, in terms of making her more sympathetic. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose I looked at other books that I've really enjoyed with um, unsympathetic central characters. Um, I really liked uh, one of Ian McEwan's books called Solar about a physicist um, who sort of works on climate change, but he's kind of this utterly despicable character, um, but you do come to sympathize with him. Um, because it sort of plays up, he sort of gets into these situations like he's um, sort of in the Arctic, desperate for a pee, <laughs> has a bit of a wee, and then he's terrified that his penis is frozen off. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, he sort of gets food poisoning. And um, even though you don't particularly warm to him, I think that kind of physical vulnerability, even in a character you don't like, is a point of connection. Um, so I guess in this story, yeah, I guess the fact that Corinne's, you know, you know what's going to happen to her, um, I think that that is a point of connection. Connection, perhaps. yeah. And there's a kind of charlatan doctor who's a South African, is it, that's based on facts, is it? Um, yeah, there's a few charlatan HIV doctors. Um, so I had a lot of material. Was there an awful lot? Because I, I can remember that. Was there an awful lot of HIV denialism around? I mean, in the sense that it didn't seem to be anything like the anti vax thing up to that. Um, um, I guess it's hard for me to gauge that. I think it was a lot bigger in America and the UK than it was in Australia. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what the scale of it was relative to people yeah. who took a more conventional route, but it was definitely out there. I think it's still around to an extent. But did you find the connection between then and what's happening now? I mean, just like I said, just anti-vaxxing as, well, as well as COVID. I mean, it must have been, did you come to the armor of your or something? Oh, sort of. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's, yeah, a vein of charlatanism, pseudoscience that's always been the flip side of yeah. conventional medicine, yeah. but yeah. Well, one of the things also it's about, which I was hoping is maybe widen out briefly, is inheritance, because we're, we're kind of like living with the inheritance of that now. Um, I mean, Alana, we're obviously living with the inheritance of what you describe. Um, I mean, you still you, you see the kind of resonance between the history and mm. and what you, you you wrote in your story. <laughs> Uh, definitely. Um, 
one of the reasons why I did really want to sort of write it with like a modern day voice as well was sort of that how much that trauma will follow you through mm. and then that can follow you like that intergenerational trauma mm. of how do you heal from that how you like you can't ever leave it behind it's it's trying to find a way that you can heal from it maybe use it as a form of education um but it's a it's a really painful thing i think to carry with you and try and find you know your place in one day life as well when you realize that it isn't as far behind as you'd like it to be yeah because yeah. what do you do with it that's a kind of like question isn't it it's a kind of because it you can't ignore it but. no you can't. um something i just really tried to do after my studies um and it was just trying to find, I think, a more positive way I could use it for, for me, like say for my PhD, I'm writing about, you know, still like ownership of women's bodies um, with an emphasis on, you know, Aboriginality, but doing it in a format that I can tolerate easier. Um, so that's within fan fiction. And so sort of having a bit of uh, humor there as well, like humor to deal with the trauma. Um, so I think that's been like my personal experience of how I've tried to use it as a more to explore it and to start a conversation about it, uh, which is something I really, really wanted to do and hopefully raise curiosity and talking about it, that it isn't such a hidden thing, because I was quite surprised when I first sort of started going into this area of study, how much people like I went on a study tour and how much like all the people in the study tour had never even heard of the term Aboriginal deaths in custody and like sort of never taken into account the extra level of violence of for Indigenous women of where do you go if you're in a domestic violence relationship do you go to the police is that a safe thing for you to do as well uh, so I thought it was really important to start this conversation but then it's this real weight on you of that you feel like you have to do this because you feel like you have to be able to use your voice to better help your community but it's also very very hard to take on and mm. very very depressing um so i think there's got to be a lot of self-care there as well mm. and do what do what you're capable of doing yeah. and chris i mean you kind of talk about there's a kind of like big historical suite but obviously this is a person your your it's about a personal family about inheritance and again it, it keeps going doesn't it these are these are questions you've been wrestling with it seems once you're alive yeah yeah when, once you once you've started to pull the thread it, it just it just keeps coming but i think for me the the personal i mean basically it's about you know the inheritance the inheritance of grief i suppose that i felt was on that piece of land and that i talk about both my parents who both lost a child in previous marriages uh that they you know, they came here to make themselves happy and they shed the skin into the into the ground, I suppose, um, in in this effort to be happy, and it was up to us as children to enact that that happiness and and, and mm -hmm. prove it. But again, in that whole idea of, of the story being, you know, having to be bigger than you are, which I really really believe, um, that inheritance of grief that Aboriginal people have, and you know, without even trying to make a comparison, we just have to look at at. at, at um, and what the big story is and mm. that's the big story so you can understand a family uh grief in this way but then to try and approach and apprehend the much bigger grief in another, in, in another way i think incredibly scary and it's it causes for and you would know this one it's really fraught for mm. a non-aboriginal person to even think about doing this but trying to do it in a way that's full of respect i think i think the only way to approach it is to go up and touch it. I remember that the writer Ali Smith said, wrote a beautiful essay about her father once and one of the things that he had taught her was that whenever she was afraid of something, whatever the great fear was, that she had to run up and touch it. And it took the fear away, but once you touched it. And I've always thought of that in terms of writing because for me it, it is fearful, it is scary. I'm always terrified about whatever I'm trying to get at in a, in a story. And this I've realised is the thing I've got to run up and touch. Okay, I mean, your development is called inheritance. So, what is it you're investigating via the story? Mm, yeah, a lot of 
different forms of inheritance is what I had in mind in writing it. Both, I mean, the main character is an only child. Her mother is already dead. Now that her father's dead, she inherits, you know, the house and material possessions. That's part of it. Uh, she refers to herself several times as lucky. You know, I didn't want to use the word privileged because it just felt too, you know, like, you know, too, too cliche, modern cliche, you know. So she calls herself lucky. And she knows very well that she is lucky both materially, but also there's something else I want to talk about, which is the, or refer to, is the, the great luck that she had in having a safe, calm, loving family that she grew up in. Also other forms of inheritance, and, and, and you kind of alluded to it, Chris, but that both your parents have lost a child in their, from their previous marriages taken from them. Um, also, um, it's part of all of our thing, all of our stories really, that loss. And uh, the man that she falls in love with, that she sort of admits she's in love with initially, he has inherited from his adult life, from, a pre, from his first marriage, he has inherited a fear of, mm, of committing himself to a relationship too early. He cannot be in a casual relationship. He knows how much he commits himself. So even though he wants to be with this woman, the main character, Rory, he knows that he can't unless she is there fully committed to. And that is a kind of inheritance that I'm really interested in as well, because I think that the, it's not just what's hand, handed down to us, it's not, just, it's not only what's handed down to us from, from previous generations, be that material or traumatic or, or, or wonderful things. It's also the life that we accrue through living. Each year that we go through affects the next year. You know, we, we create an inheritance for ourselves for good or ill. And I think it's it's wise to be, it's good to be aware of that and and not to kind of take it lightly. Um, thanks for that. Um, we might have time for some questions if there, if there are any. In. <laughs> or in the room. We, we haven't got any online yet, but you could, um, if anybody has some questions from the online audience, sorry, this is the, the disembodied voice. If anybody has any questions from the online audience, um, please feel free to type them through now. Um, and if anyone has any questions um, from the real life audience as well, if anybody would like to ask anything. No? I think. Um, oh, yes, Mirandi. Brianna. Hello. I was wondering, in, in, you know, when you were working on your piece, when you were working on your piece, I'm sorry, I hate it when people ask me this, but I'm going to ask you. <laughs> when did you realise it was going to be a novella? Did you want to always write a novella or did you think maybe it would be a short story or a novel? or? Um, I guess I started out as a short story, but I find short stories very difficult, having the limited amount of space to do something in. Um, so, yeah, I suppose I just kept going and I realised it was no longer a short story. So um, it's great to have something like the novella project that will, yeah, place things like that. So, Very. Yeah. Um, Alana, you mentioned that you want to turn your story into a novella. Was that exactly? Yes, it, it had actually started as a novella. Did I you cut it down? Or? Yes, I yeah. did, which was actually really interesting. Was I Is that had... painful? <laughs> <laughs> it was hard to decipher. I think, it, I think it was interesting really understanding, trying to understand them what the actual core of the story was. Because, you know, I had this style I wanted to write and the point of views I wanted to put in. And then when I realized to cut it down, what is the real core of the story? What is the real point I'm trying to get across here? And it was very, I think it was a really interesting exercise um, because I had like so many different points of view to get to that final sort of climax in the, uh, in the short story, in the uh, anthology and to cut all that out and still realize that, well, it did actually work. And so I thought that was really interesting. Um, I'd still like to expand it and maybe work um, 
with like the different points of view and maybe like mm. put in like those extra couple of layers of plot that I could, you know, that you can do with a novella. Um, but it was a really interesting exercise to cut it down. Exactly. John, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so this year, um, editing Griffith Review, um, have you noticed that there's been a change to um, the writers and to the work that the things that preoccupy them because we've been such through such an extraordinary experience with COVID? If anything, it's like a lot of writers seem to be struggling, um, which is kind of kind of I'm surprised about it because if you're a writer you spend most of your time in a room on your own anyway <laughs> <laughs> kind of cut off from the world um so I kind of think but I obviously think that just conceptually to be separated from the world has had some kind of like really strange ramifications and resonances and I don't think they're anywhere near kind of realizing themselves yet mm -hmm. um because kind of in the in the publishing cycle you know the first couple of editions of the year were definitely from the year before, if you know what I mean, they've been commissioned and we've been working through that. Mm. But yeah, um, kind of later in the year, this kind of edition we're finishing now, I know Ash has been struggling with some of our writers to kind of motivate them, if anything, really. Um, there's a lot of demotivation out there, strangely. Mm. Yeah. It might be interesting to, um, to kind of gather together as Griffith Review might have a chance to gather together those kind of thoughts about um, writers and community and what yeah. COVID has meant to writers. I think that would be, I'd love to hear that. It seems to me writers aren't so much the isolates that they might think they are, or other people might think they are. I mean, that kind of level of being embedded in one way or another in some sort of community obviously feeds the kind of energy or the thing you need in order to write. You know? moving in front of everyone. So um, look, I think it, it's been fantastic to have you guys here um, tonight in real life with a few people in the audience. Um, we're really slowly being able to um, move back to some kind of um, connection. But throughout, um, throughout this whole COVID experience, um, one of the things that has been still been a beating clock for us has been our events with, um, with the Griffith Review. Um, you guys have absolutely you know maybe the writers have faltered and maybe there's been some um you know stress amongst the writing community but griffith's review has you know been like a, a a machine um and i personally would like to congratulate you for um continuing like against the odds and bringing us um, exceptional work um which i'm sure took a lot of extra time to coerce out of some very stressed, <laughs> um, stressed creatives. So um, thank you very much. And thank you very much to everybody who has um, spoken here tonight and who's been in this edition. Um, every single edition of, of Griffith Review is always wonderful, but um, we always look forward to this one um, because the novella edition is always, it's my favorite. Mm. And it certainly is a favorite of a lot of our customers. It's one of our best selling um, Griffith Review editions. Um, so I encourage everybody to um, head online now. Um, you have a special code for your um, for, for your secret online um, shoppers. Um, so please feel free to use that. Um, and um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I think we should have a nice round of applause for our fantastic panel. Thank you. All right, and bye, everybody. See you later. <laughs> the weirdest thing. <laughs>